to Tactical Talk. This is Zan Khan. Recently, the North and South Korea have been engaging in peace talks. Will these peace talks be any successful? What are effects of these peace talks on South Asia? To discuss this topic, we are with us today from London, Adam Gary, the director of Eurasia Future. Welcome to our show, Adam Gary. This is Zan Khan. It's a pleasure to have you on Tactical Talk. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Adam, uh, let's get to the first question. Since we're discussing uh, the peace talks between the North and South Korea, uh, what is the history between the uh, animosity uh, between the North and South Korea? Well, the history goes back, of course, to the 1940s when the Korean Peninsula, after decades of Japanese occupation, which began in 1910, was artificially divided among the superpowers with the Soviet sphere in the north and a U.S. sphere in the south. The reunification, which was attempted in the late 1940s, didn't exactly go as to plan, for the primary reason that it was the U.S. which tried to install its ultra-reactionary government in the South, which mercilessly persecuted those who favored a more socialist model in line with that of um, of uh, Kim Il-sung, the founder of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It was therefore in 1950 when the DPRK went into the South in order to relieve the political prisoners that were being held by the pro-U.S. government. This was, of course, very shortly after the revolution in China was won by Kim's ally, Mao Zedong, and there was certainly a great deal of momentum behind this movement as there was from the position of the United States, which persuaded persuaded a very young United Nations to send troops from other nations to fight what essentially was a U.S.-led war against the DPRK. After one of the most brutal and bloody battles of all of modern history, where a great majority of all of the Korean cities were destroyed and millions killed, the peninsula remained divided largely along the same lines that it was prior to the outbreak of conflict. The armistice signed in 1953 has held just about ever since, and in recent decades, in spite of the occasional tension or flare-up, the Korean Peninsula has experienced a very uneasy but increasingly predictable peace. All of that looks as though to be changing and for the better, but for now we're still at the stage where the peninsula is divided on the 38th parallel based on the uh, 1953 armistice, even though now, after all these decades, there's talk about Pyongyang and Seoul signing a treaty which would finally formally end the conflict in Korea. Okay, Adam, let's get to the second question. What were the reasons between the tension between these two Korean regions? Well, prior to 1953, there were two questions, pardon me. There was an ideological question of which form of government should rule Korea. Should it be a pro-U.S. style right-wing government or a pro-Soviet Union style left-wing government? So there was the question of ideology and there was the issue of the elections that were held under the auspices of the U.S. and the South being patently unfair, and this is an objective fact, irrespective of whether one favors a uh, left-wing or right-wing government. Then there was the other fact that followed on from this initial development, where if various factions couldn't agree on which style of government or which ideology to follow, that uh, obviously transpired into a question of who was going to govern Korea. All of the pol political factions and political leaders in Korea wanted then, as they want now, a united Korean peninsula. For the vast majority of its history, the Koreans were a single people that were united in a single country whose borders are incredibly easily defined, unlike so many countries in the modern age, because on three sides it's surrounded by water, and then there's the cutoff in the north where there's Chinese over here and Russians over here, leading up to Vladivostok, the closest major Russian city to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, disagreements being what they were internally and based on the fact that the superpowers that were the victorious in the second one uh, allies push through what could have and should have been solved through a process of intense dialogue was instead uh, it, it instead ignited into this conflict 
So that's where we were in the late 40s and early 1950s. Where we are today is that the two sides are increasingly growing less suspicious of one another. They're increasingly open to more and more trading avenues, and they're increasingly come to trust one another's leadership. A recent poll showed that in South Korea, the North Korean head of state, uh, Kim Jong Un, has an 80% approval rating. That makes uh, the North Korean leader more popular in the South than for. A for example, Angela Merkel is in Germany, is in the United States. Um, it also shows that in terms of the North Korean leadership's attitude to the South, that both Kim Jong-un and his deputies have very much embraced South Korean President Moon Jae-in. There seems to be a genuine trust and affection between the two, and after all these years, frankly, why shouldn't there be? The Koreans are a single people that have been artificially divided, and there is a momentum on on both sides of the border for a movement towards unification. Um, and so the feelings are definitely there, and the economic realities, which are generally more important, important than feelings, also moving in a positive direction. South Korea, which through most of the 20th century was a close trading partner of the United States, has been expanding its trading relationships to what some would say, based on a Cold War mentality, are unlikely partners. South Korea currently enjoys a wonderfully strong relationship with China and with Russia, and this is quite spectacular as, for example, China and South Korea only established official diplomatic relations in 1992 but while it's only been fairly recent in the wider scheme of history, China and South Korea are enjoying a very productive relationship. President Moon has shown that he's not only sympathetic but deeply sensitive to China's fears about the U.S. over-militarization of South Korea. And with the U.S. putting up tariff walls on both its rivals like China and its traditional allies like South Korea and Japan, we're seeing that South Korea is pivoting more and more to wanting to do trade with other parts of the world, including China, Russia, the rest of ASEAN, the uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, um, into South Asia, the Middle East, Africa, all over. So as South Korea is diversifying its trading partnerships in an age where the U.S. and some of its allies in the West are becoming more hostile, you're also seeing very underreported economic reforms in the North. The, the North, ironically, to some, uh, was actually more prosperous than the South in the 50s and 60s. It was only in the 70s and moreover into the 80s where the economy of the South experienced its so-called Asian Tiger miracle, while North Korea then in the 90s had a horrible recession. That recession's now long over, and under Kim Jong-un in particular, uh, the DPRK has pursued policies of economic revitalization, uh, encouraging entrepreneurship at a local level, mass investments in new housing infrastructure, new roads, new bridges, leisure centers, culture centers, um, and a general internal opening up of the economy. Now, it's a long way from the totally revolutionary reforms of the Chinese leader, Dong Xiaoping, in 1978, but in the sense that North Korea is not only reinvesting in itself and opening up some avenues of the economy to entrepreneurial enterprise, we are seeing North Korea in what could be called the very early stages of a market socialist pivot and away from a more intensely command economic situation. So because of this, there's clearly an impetus in both the North and South to trade more and fight less. They want to trade with one another and both want to expand new trading partnerships through the rest of the world. Because of this, it only would make sense that what ought to happen after a treaty to formally end the war in Korea is signed that the two countries adopt a one country, two systems model going forward. This is the model that's used to describe the relationship between Hong Kong and Macau to the rest of China. Uh, after the reunification of Macau and Hong Kong with the rest of the mainland in 1997, the Chinese government decided to, instead of integrating totally the political systems of the mainland with two former colonies of uh, Western European powers, they'd instead engage in the creation of a hybrid system 
whereby, in spite of being in a single country with a single head of state, single passport, uh, etc., that there would be various laws that would be reflective of the historic customs in places like Hong Kong that would be allowed to run on an autonomous basis. And thus far, the system's been incredibly successful, even though the scope of the one country, uh, the one country two systems uh, situation is incredibly ambitious. So if something like that could be um, coordinated between the two Korean states, albeit with Korean rather than Chinese characteristics, we could see not only the Korean peninsula being integrated into China's incredibly important One Belt, One Road infrastructural and trade initiative, but we could also see what the Russian president discussed in, I believe it was September of 2017, where he proposed a tripartite economic cooperation scheme between the two Korean states and Russia. We're already seeing the initial stages of this being uh, engaged upon as the Russians and North Koreans are busily making a highway, the first ever of its kind, a proper modern highway between Russia and North Korea. This would itself be able to link up to the already very modern first class highways in South Korea and parallel to such a transport corridor for physical trade could be a gas pipeline. So we could have a dual economic corridor both for material trade and for the, a gas pipeline where Russia could more effectively deliver its energy supplies to a very power-hungry South Korea and what would almost certainly be an increasingly uh, power-hungry in terms of energy uh, North Korea. So we've got a great deal of potential here for a Korean peninsula to retain the char individual characteristics of governance and sociology that have developed since the 1940s in the DPRK and ROK, but all within the framework of a common trading area, a common cultural space, ideally a common diplomatic space, and perhaps in the future even a common head of state and perhaps a common currency. That's further off, but these are certainly some of the the goals which are now uh, very much realistic where just a year ago they would have been unthinkable. Um, Adam, uh, do you think that these issues will be resolved during the recent peace talks and, and deals between the two countries? Uh, officially, what have the two countries agreed upon till now? They've agreed several things. First of all, they've agreed that in the very near future, the leaders of the two Korean states will sign a treaty to end the Korean War. The importance of this is more than symbolic because it would mean that instead of legally existing in a state of war, the two Korean states would be existing in a state of peace. Once this initial treaty to end the war is signed, and I think that it could easily be, be signed long before the end of the summer of 2018, then we could see new treaties to establish a rules-based system where people from the two Korean states can cross the borders, where various items can be traded across the borders. We could have um, agreements for cultural exchange. We could have agree agreements for international investments, agreements to exchange very, uh, various currencies. So a business doing um, transactions in South Korea could then easily exchange its currency and do business in North Korea. We could see trade agreements with the outside world signed either on a, uh, on a let's say, trilateral basis where you have one party being the ROK, one party being the DPRK, and one party being a trading partner, whether it's, let's say, China, it could be Egypt, it could be Pakistan, Turkey, it could be anyone. Um, and we could then see the initial stages of a memorandum of agreement to work towards a one country, two systems model. So all of these things could very logically and I would say surprisingly rapidly flow on from a treaty to end the war. While the skeptics will always voice their opinions about all of the things that could stand in the way of an opening up of a united Korea to global opportunities of all varieties, the fact that within a few months so much has already happened is quite extraordinary. The North Koreans have agreed to renounce any hostility against the South. The, the North Koreans have agreed to cease nuclear weapons tests. They're now dismantling their facility and their plan is to engage in a fraternal 
relationship with the Southerners and with the Southern government that's frankly long overdue. Now, the only thing, frankly, that could derail this process is if the United States continues to speak arrogantly, as it has in the very recent past, and if it were to make new demands that are simply untenable. The U.S. has a tendency to keep shifting the goalposts. Whenever it gets what it wants, it changes its list of demands so that the party that they're negotiating with is under more and more pressure, feels more and more alienated, and more and more insulted. The North Koreans released a statement to this effect, expressing the displeasure of the government in Pyongyang with the fact that the uh, UN ambassador, Nikki Haley, said that war could still be on the table at a time when such language is totally counter productive when both Koreas are engaging in peace as never before. The key difference, though, between the Korean situation and the lies that the U.S. and its partners told to a country like Libya when it disarmed in 23 is as follows. Libya in 2011 was sadly abandoned by all of its allies. Russia did nothing, even though the Soviet Union had been a very important partner of the Libyan people's uh, Jemaah Haria. Uh, the Iranians, who Libya supported uh, during the war with Iraq, the only country other than Syria in the Arab world to do so. The Iranians abandoned Libya. Egypt was going through its own U.S. orchestrated uh, so-called revolution. I would call it an insurgency and a disastrous one at that. So Libya was isolated. North Korea, in spite of being isolated in the sense that it's hard for an ordinary person to go there, and once they're there, uh, they can't walk around and do commerce of their own volition, even though that may well change soon. North Korea is actually far less diplomatically isolated than an abandoned Libya was in 2011. The biggest reason for this reality is geography. North Korea shares a border with two of the three global superpowers. And what's key in understanding the relevance of this beyond the obvious, shortly after North Korea released an official statement criticizing the U.S. for continuing to proffer an antagonistic and insulting tone, Kim Jong-un went to visit Chinese President Xi Jinping, and after that, North Korea released another shorter statement, but one that was equally emphatic about the fact that they don't appreciate a U.S hurling all of this abuse at North Korea at a time when everything on the ground between Seoul and Pyongyang, between Pyongyang and Beijing, between Moscow and Pyongyang, between Moscow and Seoul, between Seoul and Beijing and all of the various combinations thereof is going so well. So while the U.S. will still perhaps try to erect some barriers to the forthcoming peace. What matters most is that this is an Asian authored, an Asian executed, and an Asian owned peace process. People say, and I believe it's quite right, that the 21st century is the Asian century. And as such, we see a coming together of both small, medium sized and large Asian powers to embrace the positive peace process in Korea, to embrace the positive changes for the people on both sides of the 38th parallel, and to say that when Korea is united, whether it's two separate countries living in peace and trading, whether it's one country, two systems, whether it's a full East-West German-style reunification, which I believe wouldn't be possible uh, for at least 10 years, although I do think that I, I could be easily corrected by events if they continue to move at a more rapid pace. The fact of the matter is all of Asia wants the two Koreas to engage in better relations, to end the war, and for more trade opportunities based on the win-win model to spring to fruition in Korea and the wider region. The U.S. might be able to hold that back temporarily, but the U.S. is outnumbered. It's the only non-Asian power involved in the peace process and the only one that could put up an obstructionist front. On the whole, even if the U.S. kicks and screams, the Asian-led peace process, I do believe, will deliver the expected results of peace for the region, more economic opportunities, and an increased standard of living for all peoples of the region, not least because less money will now have to be spent on defense and more can be spent on other things like infrastructure. Um, looking at the positive developments between North and South Korea, 
Do you think Pakistan and India could go in a similar direction, a similar peaceful direction in South Asia? I would hope so, but there are several important differences, all of which are apparent, but in the, in the blissful frenzy of celebrating a would-be, I think, very likely forthcoming peace in the Korean Peninsula, we have to point out some of these differences. First of all, the Korean people are a single people. See, they have uh, one language and have had that for hundreds of years, indeed beyond that. Um, there's not a confessional difference uh, between the North Koreans and the South Koreans in any really significant way. Where India and Pakistan are two countries with very different internal dynamics based on religion, based on ethnic questions, based on indigenous languages. So straight away, you have discrepancies based on the internal character of India and Pakistan versus the internal character of the two very homogeneous Korean states. The other issues are as follows. North Korea and South Korea don't have a border dispute. They have an artificial border. As soon as the hands between of, of Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in were shook, that artificial border between the two countries lost some of its significance, lost some of its ability to be a kind of sword hanging over the head on a string of the people of Korea. By contrast, the border disputes between India and Pakistan aren't about an internal partition, but are about delineating where one sovereign country begins and one sovereign country ends. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, there's the issue of India and occupied Kashmir. In the Korean Peninsula, there's simply no uh, analogous situation. In North Korea and South Korea, you have a common single state that was simply chopped in half, and now they're slowly working to, in one way or another, glue it back together. Indian-occupied Kashmir is a land that's suffering. Its people are living under the iron boot of an incredibly uh, brutal force, both on a military and military police level. And until that issue is solved, yes, Pakistan and India can de-escalate things, but the kind of a peaceful, harmonious existence that is breaking out on Korea won't be possible until India wakes up to the reality of Kashmir and realizes that it is not an Indian it is not an Indian region. Much so they govern it as one, uh, much so they've ruled it as one for decades, but the realities will show that until the people of Kashmir can live in the way that the majority of these people want to live according to their own democratic will, that there simply will be a huge, massive stumbling block between peace. Uh, the, there's one more important difference. In North and South Korea, the entire world, with the possible exception of a U.S. which wants to have it both ways, wishes for peace. In the case of India and Pakistan, there are a lot of countries, some big and some small, that are actively pursuing policies which are designed to increase hostility between the two countries. When you look at India's relationship with Afghanistan, you see a situation where the Indian government is using the crisis on Pakistan's western border to create more terrorist problems, more political instability, and more diplomatic problems from a, for, a, from, for a Pakistani government and a Pakistani people who want a peaceful solution to Afghanistan and want Want this to be implemented as quickly as possible. We see what India is doing in Baluchistan uh, with a long history of funding, arming and encouraging provocations. You see India taking a line on various things, whether it's border disputes with Pakistan, border disputes with China and taking an atmosphere of hostility on board. Um, until I see the Modi government and its deputies shake hands with the leaders of both Pakistan and China in a way that's as sincere and all-encompassing as that which has taken place between Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in, I think that the problems will persist. Now, this isn't to say that I'm totally pessimistic in the medium and long term. I think in any countries where there's mature leadership, even on one side, there's a glimmer of hope into a better 
better future, but ultimately it will take all of the countries in the region to want a practical and practicable peace process for Pakistan and India, and it will also take mature leadership on both sides. Now I'm increasingly seeing, and I have seen for many years, a Pakistani leadership that's mature, embracing multipolarity, embracing the Pakistan position within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is a very important early step uh, for wider peace. Under the current Indian government of Modi and the BJP, I simply don't see that. I see a government where fanaticism rather than pragmatism is the general atmosphere in which they conduct politics, and I see a situation where various disputes with regional powers are handled using hostility as the preferred tool to solve it, rather than dialogue. There is not a single problem in the world that can't be calmed through dialogue. It may take more than just dialogue to solve certain problems, but you can at least calm them down by having discussions. And so until that happens in a very meaningful and sincere way between India and all its neighbors, not just Pakistan, but China as well, and of course Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka, you have to have uh, Maldives, obviously not physical neighbors, but um, island nations. You have to have India showing more respect to its neighbors, whether they're countries that have had good relations like Bangladesh or whether they're countries that have traditionally been hostile like Pakistan uh, and China. This hostility is something that, frankly, India has created. And while there have been some Indian leaders that have shown maturity and wanting to solve these under Modi, I think it's going to either take a change in leadership or a change in mentality, and I don't see that either happening in the immediate future in India. Um, Adam, uh, since you've described Modi's approach, uh, why is Modi obsessed with a Pakistan-centric policy where he only wishes to cause Pakistan harm, uh, disregarding his own country's interests? Why do you think he's so obsessed with Pakistan, Narendra Modi? There's a simple reason for that. There are so many internal problems in India, uh, confessional problems, cost problems, problems of economic inequality that even go beyond the issue of cost. There's the rape epidemic. There's the uh, there's discrimination that's becoming systematized against anyone who doesn't follow the Hindutva BJP mindset. And all the while, you see India, which is cutting itself off from its potentially best economic opportunity with one belt, one road, and instead is going along with the U.S., which may soon put tariffs on India, because if the U.S. can put tariffs on Japan, South Korea, attempt to do it with Canada, the European Union, longtime friends, of course they're going to be able to do this with India. So Modi needs a distraction. And what better distraction than to blame all of India's internal domestic issues on Pakistan? So when it comes to trying to make India into some sort of superpower as Modi wants to do, he blames China for everything. And when it comes to everything else from internal crises to questions of intercommunitarian violence um, to questions of the economy, everything is blamed on Pakistan. It's a traditional scapegoating tactic where instead of focusing on the key issues at home, uh, he's instead blaming a neighboring country, which in terms of the Indian media culture is very easy to blame. It's a, it's a very immature way of conducting politics, whether internal or foreign, but that's the reality right now. Thank you so much, Adam Gary, for being on Tactical Talk. It's always a pleasure having you. Thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. This was Adam Gary discussing the North and South Korean peace talks and their effect on South Asian policy. Until the next episode of Tactical Talk, this is Zan Khan. Take care and goodbye.